Still in London. <laughs> How are you? I was just saying good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon. <laughs> good morning, Philip. He's part of our country strategies group. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hello, Maritza. <laughs> good morning, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hi, everybody. There. Hi, Nicolo. How are you? Hi, See you. Nicola is Italian, but is with, right now he is in New York uh, and he's got a podcast about sustainability in fashion. Good morning, Annika. So the Conscious Strategies Group uh, was actually created from Harvard, a group that studied sustainability business strategy. We are professionals that enable sustainable, sustainability professionals around the globe by bridging the gap between theory and practice. And we aim to drive positive impact through influential connection, inspiring ideas, just like Dr. Yanis will do this morning, and peer guidance based on sustainable business strategy best practice. The Conscious Strategies Hub connect like-minded leaders, like you guys, of change around the world. So it's, it is supporting the development of sustainable business strategy by sharing best practice, innovative concepts, and strong pragmatic frameworks. And our mission is to address the social and environment challenges of our time, bringing experts, scholars, students, and professionals from different industry to catalyze systematic change and develop sustainable world for all of us. We're all concerned about that. And today's session is part of a series of conversation with leading figures like Dr. Yuanu, one of them, an innovative thinker in business, science, technology, academia, to really understand how we can act now. We will explore the impact of COVID-19 in the future of free market capitalism. The global economy is an opportunity for business to confront the reality of the environment crisis and at the same time to address social and economic inequality. How do we develop models that deliver strong economic growth and measure prosperity and well-being for humans while also protecting and nurturing the planet? Prosperity, we really need to remember these things when we talk about to people that actually are not part of our group that really study that closely because business people don't realize prosperity can be associated with sustainability. So today I'm thrilled to welcome a distinguished professor to our conversation, Professor Yuanu. He wants me to call him Yanis, so we'll do that. And uh, Dr. Yuanu, uh, Yanis is actually a professor from London Business School. I'm going to talk to you about Dr. Yuanu for a little while, just a few seconds, just to give you an idea of the um, leader we have with us this morning and let your heart be open to his influential vibe. You will see what I'm talking about. So here we are, Dr. Yuanu was awarded ARCS Emerging Sustainability Scholar Award in 2016. He's a regular contributor to articles in Financial Times, Bloomberg, The Guardian, BBC, Le Monde, and Forbes. In further recognition of his impactful work, Dr. Yanou was be, has been shortlisted for the Future Thinker Award of Thinker 50. First, it's a first ever global ranking of Management Thinkers Award to recognize ideas, to have the power, the power to change the world. We all do have that in our hand. Due to the popularity and impact of his research, we're talking about Dr. Yanu, he ranks in the top 10% author of the Social Science Research Network, that's globally. He is currently a member of the editorial member of the Strategic Management Journal. With no further ado, I want to welcome and thank Dr. Professor Yuanu to be part of our Conscious Talk. 
and to share his insight about sustainability in business. Welcome, Professor Ioan. Thank you very much, uh, Karin, and everybody for joining. I know these are difficult, challenging times for everybody. Time is very limited and there's many demands on it. Um, so I particularly appreciate you taking the time this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on where you are, to, uh, to join us. I really look forward to uh, um, discussing with you, hearing uh, uh, what you have to say, and in fact, learning uh, from you. Um, in terms of the exciting things that you're up to in this space. Thank you, Dr. Yuenu. Oh, I'm seeing my friend Shalom from Israel. I have to say hello. I said it's <laughs> going to be a dynamic one. So uh, Shalom, we are just starting. Yeah, so welcome to, to join us. So the first question is, I want to say uh, to you, Dr. Yuenu, as we know, capitalism is broken. It's not working as it should. Half the world of the population is saying that capitalism is not working for them. More and more people fear, fear that their children will, don't, will not have a better life than they do. We are seeing a massive crisis of exclusion all across the world. So my question to you, Ioannis, <laughs> being in a pandemic for almost a year now, according to you, what should ESG focus on in 2021? Thank you, Corinne. That's a great and complicated and complex question. So let me try to answer it as, as best as I can. Since you have all taken the uh, Harvard course, uh, of course, you would know the, the fantastic work of Rebecca Henderson. She's also my personal friend and, and mentor. So I'm delighted that uh, we have that foundation to speak the same language as we go through the seminar. So coming to your question, um, I think I'm thinking nobody's able to predict the future, but I think COVID-19 has created some threats, if you like, some trajectories that we need to keep in mind as we, going for, as we go forward. And as we consider our collective ability, if you like, to meet the challenges and fix the system uh, which you, as you very rightly described, suffers from a number of, of deficiencies. Now, um, in, if we start looking a bit more carefully into the, uh, the impact of the pandemic, I think that, you know, there are reasons to be optimistic, but sadly, there are also reasons to be pessimistic. The important thing is that the history, in other words, the impact of the pandemic has not yet been written. And as I always say to my students, all of us have agency. And from where we are in our organizations, our teams, our companies, we can make a difference and change that story. So let's start with the positives, right? I think that the pandemic has shaken this false sense of safety and security that many of us had in the system, that somehow capitalism had uh, mastered or dominated even uh, nature and the planet, and therefore we were all safe and sound in what we were doing, and nothing could stop us, nothing could stop us on this you know, trajectory of never-ending economic growth. It took a virus that, relative to other viruses, is not as deadly, it's not as deadly as Ebola, for instance, but it's a virus that could actually that actually brought the world economy to its knees, uh, going over a year now. So I considered that a positive because if we think that we have seen anything with the COVID-19, uh, we're you know, strongly deluded, right? Because if we start thinking about climate change, the loss of biodiversity, global mm -hmm. warming, and so on, those are massively more complex issues. So I'm hoping that this shaking of this, this false sense of safety and security will propel us to more deeply think about and potentially prepare for these uh, challenges that are already hitting us. The, 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 the impact of climate change and loss of biodiversity and acidification of oceans and air pollution, all of those impacts are already with us. The problem with them, of course, is that there's no vaccine for them. Those are require, going to require much more complicated solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's a positive in my view. Mm. which clearly is going to have implications in terms of how do we think about ESG at a personal, at an organizational, even at yeah. the national or even planetary level. Mm 
right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the second thing that I think is absolutely critical is, is the fact that we've seen a renewed confidence in and, and faith, if you like, and trust into the role of experts of data-driven research-based decision-making. And you know what? That is precisely why every evening in most countries around the world, we are all waiting to hear what do the epidemiologists say? Can we go out? Can we not go out? What are the predictions? Are our healthcare systems going to collapse or not? And can we avoid mm -hmm. their collapse? So, and I'm saying that that is a, a tremendous positive because in many countries around the world, including the US and particularly the UK, we have seen an all out war against experts and against facts, against truth, right? I recall even conversations we had in this country, in the UK, when uh, major politicians were, were saying that we have had enough of experts in this country and all that kind of nonsense, right? Mm. So I'm hoping that, you know, uh, by elevating reinstating, if you like, the role of uh, experts and the research and data driven, and we see that, of course, with quick development of vaccines and so on, we are not only going to restore our faith in science and experts, but as a matter of fact, we're going to start channeling the necessary investments in that direction. Mm -hmm. The fact that the US was so miserably unprepared for the pandemic was, a, was because even though from Barack Obama to Bill Gates and everyone was warning about it, the Trump administration came in and dis dismantled the pandemic preparedness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So Don't get all... me started with politics, Dr. Yenu. Yeah, yeah. oh, please do, politics. please do. I would love to go there. Um, <laughs> Marisa knows about that. In California, yeah, and yeah. I think we're getting lucky with the United States also, the fact that uh, we've got Gina McCarthy that is taking care of advising the Biden administration. This is just wonderful. Uh, so absolutely, I think that was probably the biggest watershed event of the century, if you ask me, that the U.S. Uh, changed administration and uh, mm -hmm. at least gave us a chance at hope. Not hoping, but at least a chance at hoping. Yes. Um, so those, I would, uh, I, the, the Two biggies on, on the positives. The other one that is absolutely essential, I think, in my view, again, directly linked to this idea of the role of business in society, the role mm -hmm. of ESG integration, is that it has forced us, at least some of us, to start rethinking the social contract, to realize that, first of all, when, uh, when these pandemics or these disasters hit, it is the vulnerable, it is the poor, and it is the neglected that are often hit the most. And that can happen within countries, especially mm -hmm. think about the UK that I know best in terms of how much uh, the ethnic minorities are much more heavily hit by COVID and by the rate of deaths and by the rate of disease compared to the rest of the population. Um, thinking about the fact that, you know, it was so important when you're locked at home to be able to have someone that works for your local supermarket, that, that mm -hmm. someone that will pick your trash and that someone that will actually deliver your food, that your water supply is going to be working and that those invisible supplies, that your Amazon delivery was going to come to <laughs> your door, yeah. right? So I, I'm, I think that a lot of people started, they think, and I haven't even mentioned, of course, you know, the, the critical, the fundamental importance of healthcare systems, of the mm -hmm. doctors and the nurses that, you know, exhibit the, the ultimate self-sacrifice, right, of, of taking care of us. As many of us were getting sick and as many of us were getting sick, a lot of the times because we were irresponsible and we did not mm -hmm. actually follow government guidelines or scientific guidelines. So that renegotiating or I think or rethinking of the social contract is going to have great implications about how do businesses think about environmental health and safety of, of their employees? How do we think about the responsibilities in terms of our supply chains? How do we think about, you know, the role of business and how critical it can become even in the, in the midst of the pandemic? Yeah. And I would add another important thing, which is the fact that we have seen this in Europe a lot, and hopefully we'll see this in the US now, the fact that uh, this whole discussion about building back better, mm -hmm. the idea that we cannot invest trillions and trillions of dollars into mm -hmm. industries that are actually going to make 
these pandemics or even worse natural disasters, even worse than this one. Mm. In, in other words, thinking about, you know, do we reinforce fossil fuel based uh, industries? Do we even fossil fuels themselves, right? Um, I am not too optimistic about that discussion because, you know, uh, it is not, according to some estimates, if you see the situation globally, this stimulus money, as we call it, is not mm -hmm. really going into green causes. To yeah. some extent, that's understandable, right? Because, well, let's be honest, we, as globally, we have miserably failed to, to devise transition plans. We have these big, important targets and, and as companies and as countries, but yeah. we're very thin and very silent in terms of the particular paths we're going to take and the particular transition plans we're going to follow in order to get there, which basically means... Yeah. So it, 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 it carries the risk of all this stimulus money actually not being used to build back better, right? I yes, mean, and I can, if I can add Ioannis, as you allowed me to ask me to, yeah, to call you Ioannis, and as, what I hear in that also is the fact that, yes, government, yes, business, but citizen, we are citizen. As leaders into business, we need to lead the, the team but also as citizen and as town, you know, as country. But everyone's got a responsibility into this aspect, as you were saying. So, and everybody's got a voice and that can make a big difference because the government and the leaders, they need to listen more. They, they need to listen more to who? To us as citizens. So I think it needs to be transmitted to the next generation and to everyone around us in your kitchen in on your Zoom with friends and family. So there's an action that needs to be realized from a possibility of hope, as you said, to every citizen uh, within us. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'll let you continue your idea yeah. before I no, I think that was that was did bring me to the next positive point, Karin, which is yes, to good. actually highlight the role of government right yeah. the role of government and uh, that that has been so essential around the world mm -hmm. and it kind of reminded us that you know government can be very effective especially when it's you know um, acting under the guidance of experts and science and evidence right in terms of mm -hmm. devising lockdowns instead of in terms of coming around with furlough schemes in terms of actually sustaining the whole economy right because mm -hmm. you know let's be honest the co corporate world as I'm sure Rebecca has uh, told you quite extensively, has for decades um, uh, uh, battled and fought against uh, government to the extent mm -hmm. that they have, you know, they, they, uh, reduced government in terms of its size and its impact and trying to affect everything through institutional corruption, which we call lobbying activities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we had that hijacking of governments and then suddenly yes. when everything is collapsing around us. Well, where do all of these guys go for bailouts? Well, they go to the government, right? Mm -hmm. So that highlights to me that, you know, it, it's not an either or, all government, or all business. It has exactly. to be a partnership. It has to be a collaboration. Yes. But mm -hmm. then, Karina, as you were rightly pointed out, that reflects back on us because essentially we are the government exactly to, right exactly that's what we, i mean yeah 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 we are the government if yeah. we run for office if we raise our voice and importantly one of the most important decisions in my maybe it's because i'm greek and i'm saying this but i do think that one of the most important decisions that we make is in the voting booth exactly. and again the crisis has highlighted how important that is look at the utter failure of uh, the us under trump look at the cronism and the corruption of the uk government that mm -hmm. actually gives even PPE contracts to his cronies and to the friends and relatives of its ministers in the midst of a crisis, right? That's the level of corruption we're talking about. And these are visible and there is accountability. So it is also our responsibility to vote or in this case, not vote um, for these candidates. So I think there's, as you see, there's a lot of positive to go on. I think that it's an existential kind of discussion here that we're having. And, and it's, it's almost, it, it awakens us to the fact that if we are running businesses uh, to become more specific, how yes. could we possibly ignore this broader environmental and social context in which businesses operate? How could we possibly not yes. look at our responsibilities, right? Exactly. And the other thing, yeah, in this in this crisis is 
uh, the, the, what I will often call as the world is watching. Yes. We have mm -hmm. investors, we have AI technologies, we mm -hmm. have data companies that watch every single reaction and mm -hmm. every single step that companies have taken during the pandemic, either to protect their employees and or to contribute to the local community or to contribute to the country, for instance, by switching to producing PPE. So um, all those are very positive. We can go to the negatives as well. It's not a rosy picture, but I hope that answers your question in terms of what yeah. we should be considering as inputs, perhaps, uh, yeah. that will help us understand, I think, how ESG may develop in the next couple of years. That's right. ESG in 2021 was the question. And as you were saying, it's going to transform into businesses, but into our life also, uh, the economy and also our daily life as leaders into business so we need to listen and be attentive it's a it's a it's a duty that every citizen's got be attentive to what's happening and what's saying what so to learn and to be able to make uh really your own idea of what's happening and if it makes sense because sustainability is quite basic if you think about it it's to be responsible about everything your neighbor, your town, yourself. I mean, it's 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 just really every level. All those dimensions needs to be taken care of. So, Dr. Yanu, what brings me to tell you, as our professor, uh, our favorite professor, since you never talked to us yet. <clears throat> So our favorite professor from Harvard that we had, Dr. Rebecca Henderson, she was saying that we need the free market to be balanced by government. And also we need public goods, as you were saying, and we need strong social net, strong education and health system to ensure that there's a real freedom of opportunity. So we need to be equal in all this. And we need decent labor legislation and we need the minimum wage in a lit is to be a living wage, right? We need a strong government to regulate the, the, the pollution right now. And we need businesses to create profit, but also to address some of the major social and environmental problem. Let's not forget the social. We've been hearing about the environment for so long, but the S in ESG is really key these days, the social aspect. So we have to create a shared value. Shared value is really a term that we, we hear quite often and more and more. And that maximizes value in the long term and collectively. That's another term that Dr. Rebecca Henderson used a lot, collectively. And the purpose-driven company uh, who actually hold themselves accountable, they are using the ESG metrics. So my question to you, Dr. Yanu, how do you see the economic ecosystem for a promising future? Um, so, <laughs> again, a very, very big uh, question, Karine, and of yes. course, I, I couldn't uh, disagree with every, anything that, uh, that Rebecca was saying. I do think that mm -hmm. it, um, there is a lot of discussion on this idea of the purpose-led organization and so on, but as I'm, as I'm sure, uh, let, let me tell you my sort of a, a, a theory of the world, if you like, in terms of the, the system and, and how it works, as I often tell my students when I, I teach sustainability, I think mm -hmm. that, yes, we have a system and yes, that we have a government, but at the end of the day, the productive unit, the economically productive unit and the unit that has these positive and negative impacts, it all boils, boils down to companies, right? Companies mm -hmm. are the ones mm -hmm. that are going to innovate these products. Companies are the ones that are going to be efficiently, effectively and profitably scaling them up. Mm -hmm. So when I teach sustainability, personally, I urge my students to come, kind of take a step back and think about the basics. What is a company? Why do we have companies before we even go to start thinking about the ecosystem, right? So when we ask that very profound question, I think the answer is both simple as well as powerful. Mm -hmm. I think that companies are simply stated, they're problem solvers. Mm -hmm. In other words, they see a gap in the market, an unmet need in the market, Mm -hmm. something that in need of a solution and what do they do they innovate products and services and they address that need right yes. now 
the critical component though, and this is something that in my view, no other institution has been able to do that well, is that companies can scale up those solutions very efficiently and very effectively. Wow. Unfortunately, <laughs> in the past, right, it's a, they've built that capability at the expense of, in this case, the environment, mm -hmm. at the expense of uh, negative social impacts and so on. Nonetheless, this scaling capability, it is absolutely essential. Why? Because the challenges that we face are so big, whether we talk about uh, environmental or social issues. So we need, if you like, these problem solvers. And I think the whole sort of push towards sustainability and purpose-led organizations is, it's, it's in my view at least, it's all about business executives really understanding these problems and bringing about the apparatus of their organizations, the mm -hmm. capability of their organizations to, to um, address at least some of these problems. Now, mm -hmm. if we start expanding from that and, and going, as you said, on the ecosystem level and not just the organization. But we let need me to add something, Yanis. By all means, go ahead. Yes, yes, please. Um, yes, leaders and board director, they need to understand. But I believe to act, they need to believe. You know, like they need to believe to actually act on it, you know, because it's kind of... Being from the communication side, you know, I know that for some of the board directors, it's just like a nice report at the end of the year, you know, it's like a check mark. So yeah, yeah they understand it's important. Is it important to have a good, a good reputation, notoriety? But those <clears throat> metrics that we talked about, I don't know if everybody is aware of that, and we can send information after the webinar that, you know, I'm really intended to do that and also explain all the acronym that we are using this morning, because maybe it's not everybody that is actually from sustainability per se, because we're over 50 person right now. But what I'm, I'm saying is that board members, they've got such a power. It's not only to understand business and profit, as we know, but I believe in them, like they really have to make sense of how do they, um, they will uh, believe that they can make a difference. So that's a big issue also. It's kind of an, it's kind of, of the emotional side and the personal side that we need to work because once they have believe it, believed in it, uh, they will go for it, you know, into their own life and in, in their, um, their company. Absolutely, Karine. And, uh, and again, in, in my course on sustainability, I actually yes. function on those two levels where I, I often say to the participants that it's the heart and the mind. Oh, so see? Uh, mm -hmm. I can show you the graphs of the financial outperformance. I can show you the, uh, you know, all the numbers and the statistics. Those are necessary, but they're not sufficient mm -hmm. conditions to create this sense of urgency and transformational change. It's also about as you mentioned, the, the, the heart as well. Mm. And in my view, you know, that's much more difficult to achieve, right? We know, I mean, we do have uh, some idea of how that's done. We do see, we've seen that, you know, some of the most, you know, uh, uh, visionary CEOs, why are they so visionary? Is because they feel this sense of responsibility towards generations that perhaps haven't even arrived on this planet yet. Exactly. They, they feel that personal sense of responsibility when they look at their own or their broader families, kids or grandkids, or in general, the younger generation. So in the best cases that I have seen and I have interacted with, as you very rightly pointed out, that commitment, if you like, that vision is very personal. But mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be only the CEO. I think across the world, when we see bottoms up approaches um, uh, across companies as employee initiatives, for instance, it does come from, um, uh, from the place of the heart. Look at what happened at Amazon, for instance, and the employee reaction by the thousands when they felt that the Amazon does not do as much as they ought to do on environmental issues. Look at the whole, and I, I totally applaud this whole, um, you know, uh, uh, movement tools whistle, whistleblowing and really understanding mm. what's happening within organizations because that's precisely when the rubber meets the road, right? That's when mm. we, it's when, when nobody's, it's, it's what you do when nobody's looking that matters, yeah. right? That's yeah. as the old saying goes. Mm -hmm. So I'm absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. And that, as we were talking about earlier, 
tells us why this process is so complex. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Why this organizational change process, it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, that's why, um, Karin, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, I do hear a lot. I mean, not that I'm not sympathetic to the idea of shared value, but it has been misinterpreted oh, uh, out okay. there, right? I mean, mm -hmm. outside of this group that have actually formally learned the concept, yeah. outside the, this group, many people use wear on their sleeve the the, uh, the the shared value concept and they think that oh sustainability find a stakeholder hold hands dance kumbaya create shared value and the world <laughs> is going to be a better place yeah three hundred in, <laughs> right we are all in business there's no free lunch if only strategy or if only sustainability was that easy we would be living in an ultimately green planet that's not what's yeah. happening yeah. it's about dealing with those trade-offs that's why um when I talk with my students again, I often say that sustainability is not just a disruption. Sustainability is the mother of all disruption. Yes, yeah, that's what you said. I saw right? that. Yep. And when we caught up as well, because we say, oh, big data, AI, and don't get me wrong, those are very important things as well. Yeah, they, right. don't, mm -hmm. they don't require, though, that such a fundamental change in the identity, the values, and the culture and so personal change perhaps mm. of the organization. And so I always encourage people that want to, you know, en engage on this process and lead this kind of transformation to have a quick look at the corporate graveyard. The corporate graveyard is packed with once iconic brands that thought that they have cracked the code of success yeah, exactly. or that no disruption will ever affect them. They, mm -hmm. were, they were grossly wrong. And I think many people think that, oh, if I start slow with the product here and there, if I uh, tweak this and tweak that, I'll be a sustainable company. It's not going to help. Uh, it's not going to work that way. The Teslas are going to come in. The Beyond Food are going to come in. The Impossible Foods are going to come in. And no matter how traditional their industry are, you're in, they're going to upset, uh, uh, upset the, 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 the forces and they are going to uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, replace you if they can do this yes. better. Yes, and so, as you said, the force are the people also, right? As people understand, they can actually use their voice, as you were saying, to make yeah. the government change, yeah. and then the economy change. And that's so absolutely that critical, Karin, if I yeah. can add one more, more point, is that if you look at the most, again, the most uh, uh, frontier venture capitalists, right? You yes. will see that at top of mind is this idea of ESG for startups. How yeah. can I actually find and invest in the next Tesla? How can I find and invest? in the mm -hmm. next impossible food what sort of criteria because all of our esg that we know and learn and love it's all based on large public companies yes if we don't yet know what does it mean to to have an esg startup yes. how do we know which startups are going to be better placed to tackle the world's biggest challenges That's right when true. we don't have a track record as we have for public companies for instance yes. and yes. those I, I would dare say those are kind of at the fourth uh, the frontier what we don't yet understand but it's mm -hmm. going to be so much absolutely essential think about any industry around the world every yeah. wave of disruption comes with a lot of new entrants that typically bring the innovation with them why should we in this case think that it is only the large companies that are going to transition or yeah. adapt I that's totally not going to happen agree. right Yes, I totally agree, uh, Ioannis. And you know, what you're saying is typical to the Quebec, because Quebec in Canada, because I'm mentioning it because there's people, over 50 people from uh, all around the world here. In Quebec, we have a reality of entrepreneurship. That's, this is the biggest number that we have into businesses. They are entrepreneur. And you're right, you know, we don't read a lot about that. The fact that ESG, so I'm repeating the acronym, is uh, Environment, Social and Governance Metrics to measure how do they do this business. And not only that, it allows everybody to understand based on to a standard uh, criteria that everybody can understand and relate to so not only saying you know out of their mind oh they think they do well or not it's based on something that has been thought through and is also uh, equal to every company so i think this is a wonderful line the idea that you're saying that it should be used in smaller businesses this is a, an avenue that i think we should promote more 
And that lead me to my next question, Dr. Yanu. We were I'm talking- Karin, sorry to interrupt you. I see two yes. hands up. I'm not sure if you can see yes. them. Perhaps you know, there are questions I'm... that are related to this point or should we let them uh, um, ask them later? Up to you. I'm totally yes. fine. You are yes. running the show, so yes. you tell me. Yes. You know what? Uh, thank you for a question, guys. I'm very, very, very happy to see there's some question. I'm, if you guys can stay with us for longer, um, Maritza is going to wave at me if someone is urgently needing something. OK, Maritza? But um, uh, what I'm hoping is just to go through the last question together, Dr. Yanu, and then you guys will have a good 20 minutes with Dr. Yanu to actually discuss and have open discussion. Everybody's good about that? All right, so we'll just keep up with the uh, same thing for you, Jonathan. Yes, Jerusalem, you're good with that? <laughs> okay, so here, um, Dr. Yanu, what I wanted to say about the ESG, uh, the metrics, do you think they should be mandatory? Because right now, North America, we are really behind you guys from Europe, New Zealand, like we know they've been, you know, pretty good with that, so we're watching you. Do you think mandatory would make a huge difference? I have my opinion, but I really want you to hear about it. <laughs> to hear I think it's a, it's a, you know, the whole idea of transparency and ESG or sustainability reporting is, is a fundamental one. And I think it's the one we're going to see a lot of developments in the next year or so. Yes. Now, let me just like start by acknowledging that, uh, especially for those of you that already work in sustainability, that this space right now, it's a big mess. Right. Mm -hmm. There is the alphabet soup. There are many voluntary um, reporting standards. There are initiatives to integrate. There are initiatives to integrate the initiatives to integrate. Right. And then there are meta initiatives to do that. So and there is a lot. We are going through the period of what I would call this muddy middle, whereby uh, we have a proliferation of standards, but we do not have a uniformity compatibility yet. However, I Here's, there's always two sides to the story, right? Because mm -hmm. all of those initiatives, for to me at least, they signify that these are important issues. These are not going, that's why so many people are trying to measure them. That's why so many people are trying to get to a standard, right? That's and right. also, uh, again, this is where I think historical perspective works. If you think about financial reporting, and perhaps some accountants in the audience would know this, right? Yes, How I long did it how long did it take us to arrive at financial reporting standards? And even then, we don't have a global standard. It took us 80 to 100 years. It took, it took something huge like the Great Depression to say, oh, maybe we should know about how to compare profitability across companies that are listed, for instance, right? So compare and not notice the, the term ESG did not exist 10 years ago. Is, right, yeah. and now we are talking about multiple frameworks, materiality, double materiality, dynamic materiality, and so on. So, compared to financial reporting, we're moving at the speed of light, and we're yes. moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So, the fact that you now have so many institutional players coming in, and and uh, for instance, IFRS, even the European Central Bank is thinking about how to uh, do the the quantitative easing by accounting for green versus uh, brown. Uh, industries and therefore developing a taxonomy in order to yes. make those investments. I We're think not. that, you know, I understand. So if I wear my investor hat on, because I'm, I'm actually, you know, also on the board of ESG uh, board do. of DWS. So if yes, I were to do. see this from an asset management point of view, it's an absolute nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and we haven't even started talking about other asset classes, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like debt, for instance, and bonds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But if I were to, to, where my academic had on, I think that we all we see the, the the strong evidence that the world is moving in that direction. The best of companies are already preparing for it. They are already disclosing. And you know what? If you're a company that does this, you want mandatory standards to clear the noise because everyone now wants to be seen as doing something. Which and therefore we're getting flooded with greenwashing. Or if we're talking about the investment world, everybody applies an ESG label to any fund and then suddenly we think we're all sustainable. So mm -hmm. you want that kind of uh, scrutiny. The one thing that I would uh, urge kind of caution though, is that, yes. and I think people make this mistake a lot of the times and I'll, I'll stop there so we can take questions. So yes. first of all, I think that this is not just an issue of transparency and reporting. People need to realize that 
companies themselves are still experimenting with the underlying practices. It's yes. not that we have something ready-made cooked, and then the question is, how do we measure it? The yes. underlying practice in the broader level, uh, broader uh, domain of ESG is changing. So mm -hmm. we need to, if we were to arrive at this standard, we need to build in flexibility. We need to uh, account for the fact that there's still underlying experimentation happen. And the last, the, the second point of caution I urge is that a number of these issues are what we would call academically socially constructed. What yeah. does that mean? They matter because as a society, we collectively agreed that they matter. Mm -hmm. So 50 years ago, let's be honest with ourselves, right? Gender pay equality did not matter. Mm -hmm. Diversity did not ma it matter for the people that were ignored, obviously, but I'm talking about collectively, institutionally, legally, regulatory, in terms of regulations, right? Mm -hmm. But over time, those issues emerged. And, and therefore, well, no matter what standards we come about, we need to, they need to be dynamic enough to reflect the issues that we collectively care as societies. And those change. And I would say that COVID, for instance, perhaps reminded us in a very not so, not so nice way that you know, uh, health and safety uh, in, in the supply chains, the interdependence of supply chains, health of employees, and so on, it's absolutely... Sick, uh, sick leave, the healthcare system, those are all fundamental and perhaps ignored in the recent years. So any standard that eventually becomes mandatory and should become mandatory so that we level the playing field, absolutely, but with the caveats of evolving practices and emerging uh, socially constructed issues that need to be accounted for. Yes, yes, I totally agree. And talking about talking from the communication standpoint, I would say metrics are wonderful because it's really a good way to explain what the company are addressing in a really a standard way. So that's that's a great way to communicate. So I'm happy uh, that we have a lot of questions and I w really want to let people uh, be able to have a a one-on-one -on -one kind of discussion with you, uh, Dr. Ioannis. Um, uh, I know that uh, Dr. Ioannou asked me to call him Dr. <laughs> asked me to call him Ioannis, and I have a hard time to be back at Ioannis. <laughs> so his uh, first name is Ioannis, and last name is Ioannou. So, uh, Professor Yanis, please, uh, you know, we're just going to go with some hand, you know, please, yes, people, please, just open your mic uh, one at a time and uh, feel free to ask your question. Um, I don't feel like being the DJ here and reading all your questions, so bear with me and jump in, okay? So, it's a flexible, collaborative platform, so jump I'm, in. I'm happy to do that, Karin. I'm used to it, so have no fear. Yes, I, can I know. Do Zoom is my home, so it's okay. I know. I know that. Uh, I know so you're a champion. Let, let's start with Gina. I see three hands at least. Let's start with Gina and then take uh, uh, Nicolo, if I remember correctly the name before, and Mark. Um, and I'll try to, uh, uh, you know, multitask and read written questions should they come in. So Gina, go ahead. Yeah, so first of all, it's a great discussion, very interesting, and I'm very grateful to Maritza for introducing me to this uh, concept. I didn't mention before my background, so I'm a maritime lawyer in shipping. So sustainability is a very main hot topic at the moment. There's regulation coming out. And we've actually recently launched, I've also launched um, a, a room in Clubhouse that's called sustainability and shipping. So it's very important to us. But one of the recurring things that come up, because I also um, uh, invented my own company, created my own company um, to help um, the shipping industry in its branding. Mm. When it comes to sustainability, you both mentioned earlier that it's, it's important for the boards to understand it and to feel it and to see what the benefit is. Um, but the recurring topic that comes, because shipping is a very commercial industry, is that mm. financially, though, this is a huge burden on ship owners and the industry is not one that it's booming. So um, that's the great, I'm seeing great difficulty there in then from them going from a mindset to understanding the value of sustainability to just filling in a checklist based on the new regulation from the IMO. So I don't know, maybe you could share some thoughts on that that would be insightful. And I would be very happy if you're on Clubhouse to have you as a speaker on one of the sessions. It's every Monday afternoon. 
Yeah, absolutely. So Gina, that's a that's that's the core of what I was saying earlier, that these are difficult decisions, right? That we're not gonna hold Kumbaya and do it and everyone is gonna be happy. These are expensive, these are expensive investments, right? But what is the alternative? I was reading a very nice book recently, by the way, that I would actually recommend to all of you. It's a sci-fi climate climate change sci-fi book called The Ministry for the Future. Okay. So it takes us into a world in which the Paris Agreement creates a ministry, a global ministry to represent the uh, uh, the the, the, the um, uh, interest of future generations in today's mm -hmm. decision making. It's a fantastic book. But as as I'm going to borrow a phrase from that uh, a fantastic book that says, you know, Gina, it's always better to go long on civilization rather than short civilization in the short run, just because it's too expensive, right? So the idea being that it is expensive, but the damage that the industry and any polluting industry is doing on the environment is going to be much more costly to fix down the line, not only for the industry, but for all of us. Now, uh, having said that, I think that's precisely the point where you need to have the collaboration of government and industry in order to arrive at those cost-effective solutions that are also environmentally responsible. And we have done that. The entire solar industry boomed because it started with heavy subsidies, right? Mm -hmm. Because companies, sorry, governments realized that by not transitioning the energy system, they're gonna have much more detrimental impacts down the line. This is precisely the point, the, the reason why we need governments, because companies don't do that, we need governments to invest in basic research, in basic R&D, because that's where the solutions are going to come. So, for instance, in your industry, you can start talking about new types of fuel, for instance, and bringing them down to a price that would actually make commercial sense. Or other types of regulations, for instance, think about the fact that the EU is thinking about the carbon border tax, right? What if in that, that carbon border tax also took into account the transportation emissions? That means nothing that um, uh, that that was produced with a carbon intensive with, with high carbon intensity is going to come into the EU without being taxed, for instance. That can move an entire industry as opposed to an entire uh, uh, just one company. So mm -hmm. uh, to solve those pro and it's not just on the transportation industry, right? Think about airlines, for instance, and and uh, uh, um, aircraft manufacturers. There is no viable technology compared to uh, yet in terms of electric uh, uh, airplanes. Think about industry, uh, for instance, steel making. Right, there are a couple of ideas here and there, but uh, steel making is so intense on 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 CO two emissions and very few, if any, available innovations. But you need to rethink about the whole process and that, and, and even go back to material science. Hence, why you need investments in basic research. So that's why I'm hoping that going forward we're going to start seeing for instance trade associations let's say the entire shipping industry working with governments identifying where are the innovation gaps and working in the same way that the solar industry did and getting either subsidies or more basic research in order to in order to get us there and it's not going to happen overnight that we can start thinking about kind of a step-by-step -step approach now uh, and I'll, this is the last thing i'm going to say and, and, and take more questions. I think that in the short term, you're right. It's absolutely frustrating. And it's absolutely because, but, but don't forget, Gina, in my view, nobody innovated from the comfort of their couch. Mm -hmm. Most of the companies innovate because of necessity, because of bottlenecks, because they of problems, right? So in my, in my experience, you know, the best of corporate leaders take these problems and transform them into opportunities, right? It's like John F. Kennedy that says, what if we could put the man on the moon by the, on the, moon by the end of the decade? <laughs> NASA didn't sit there and complain, oh, we cannot do this. We don't have the technology. It will never happen. No, it bought the vision and then rethought the entire technology in order to get there, and they did it. Right? That's the kind of leadership that we need. And I think that's the kind of leadership that is going to survive this disruption. Yeah, totally yeah. agree. Thank you, Dr. Yanu. Thank you for answering. And I think I you it. numbered some people. Like, was it Nico, the next one? I don't yes. remember. Yeah, yes. So, Nico from Man Manhattan. Yes. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. And uh, Professor, I love your passion and the way you are spreading the voice of sustainability. And this is very, very amazing. I told I you, Nico. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Great, great passion. So 
in the same way, we, because I'm speaking also with Nicolo, that is uh, and my teammate here on the board, and you know we work in fashion, and uh, this is not, what I'm saying is not a question; it's a consideration. It's uh, working in fashion that is the most polluted industry in the world. Yep. We use it's a three trillion dollar business, and uh, and only the top 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 niche of the great brand are sustainable or are thriving to be more sustainable. Then that's what, that, that. that's when they don't burn their clothing to maintain prices, I would assume, or killing animals to wear them on our necks. But yes, Nico, Nico, yes. Maybe, yeah. maybe they are a bit sustainable. Yes. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, this is, a, you know, I. this is, a, this is, yours is the right comment, but there is like people like Caring and other big brands that are doing great yeah. things for their supply chain. But bottom line, our industry need government help because we are all corporate, public company traded in New York, in Paris or, or Milan, and we need revenue every three months. And without government direction and without government um, aid, this industry would never change because it's, it's pure cost margin driven business. And uh, we really need to uh, work together as an industry to make it happen, to go to the next level. Today, we are in a dark room. Yeah, I just a quick comment on that, uh, Nico. I think uh, you're absolutely right. As I said, nobody can go at this alone, right? It's a, it's a collective exercise. We all we need all those agents including civil society to hold us accountable in the same that they do they hold accountable other industries like the asset management industry and so on however i wouldn't uh, in a sense delegate or actually outsource if you like all the responsibility to governments because i said as i said before governments are us we elect these people we put them there they should be reflecting our decisions and our preferences um but indeed you are in an industry that has been traditionally being associated with you know, excessive perhaps consumerism, the fact that you have so many, you know, seasons of clothing coming out and the quick fashion and so on without really a way of recovering that material or reusing those clo that, the clothing and so on. So I think that that does, uh, you know, fit into this broader idea of how do we measure growth and how do we understand human growth? And and I think I, I probably you, you spoke with Rebecca about this as well. It is this idea of is measures like GDP and economic growth enough to capture uh, our human development, if you like, or should we be measuring um, uh, human success and happiness and wholesomeness in some different way? Uh, because uh, let's be honest, industries such as the fashion industry are kind of the pinnacle of consumerism, right? They count on you being that, that a consumer that, you know, measures your well-being and sometimes your self-identity by uh, by the fashion that you have now however i would uh, i i would uh, say though that you know um uh, all companies face trade-offs it's not that sustainability is something new in terms of trade-offs for instance when you decide how to allocate a budget you need to say well this much goes on marketing and this much goes on salaries for instance right this much goes on procurement and this much goes on salaries and so on so those traders are endemic to any strategic decision so i would dare say that uh, um, despite the thin margins even in the in the in the fashion industry companies should start especially the largest ones but even others should start experimenting perhaps perhaps even at the industry level with using new materials with using new ways of dyeing the clothes in without producing so much toxic waste or wasting water for instance right mm -hmm. some of the fundamental material issues can and do benefit from industry level approaches in in again in association with with government policy so i wouldn't i wouldn't say it's only government or only corporate responsibility the problem is too big it's 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 both right mm -hmm. uh and and therefore the, the collective action there can have a big impact um mark 
Yes, if I can just complete, oh, yeah, the, I I know what the Nico is working on. He's got a podcast. Both Nico and Nico uh, are working in fashion, and they got a great podcast. And I've been through all the podcasts, and they address these aspects. They actually do address these aspects. So you know, it's it's a point that uh, you mentioned, uh, Doctor Yanu, that is really important. You know, looking at R and D and uh, using different materials. So. Thank you for your answer and thank you, Nico. Thank you. Yes, Doctor, hi, this is Mark. Hi, um, Mark. Uh, great, uh, great, very insightful uh, session. Thank you very much for it. Um, my question is around uh, what this pandemic has revealed, which is the inclusion of hibernation capability, not just at the firm level, but at the macroeconomic level. So we're talking about the need for an economy or a, uh, a firm to be able to go into pretty much survival, basic survival mode, um, or buying itself the time for it to be able to respond to the adverse condition which has been revealed. Um, I mean, this is if you put it in the context, for example, of maybe a, a virus which was not just as um, uh, contagious as uh, this one, but probably even more lethal than this one, would create the need, a much bigger need for economies to be able to shut down. Our financial and our economic models today are built on the premise that we never slow down. Slowing down is a bad thing. It creates loss, it creates loss of value, it creates negativity. Uh, but as we bring civilization very close to complete displacement of nature, um, we are facing more of these existential questions where the crisis becomes at such a high level, we actually reach points where we are looking at shutting down the global economy completely. And we have to look at that as a, a, um, a capability, a strategic capability that needs to be built into our financial and our economic model. Is there any academic work happening in this regard? Uh, let me uh, let me see how to tackle that question, Mark. I I think you raised some very important points that uh, perhaps we um, quickly touched upon later uh, previously, which is in terms of how do we measure and understand economic growth and progress. And what you're basically criticizing, if I'm understanding correctly, is this insatiable uh, you know uh, demand and speed towards economic growth, often at the detriment of many things, including. Uh, uh, all the negative externalities that we just discussed. Now, um, I would urge caution, though, because uh, I do feel the, the privilege of the position that I am in to say, well, yeah, at some conditions, it would make sense for hibernation, as you call it, to happen because I can teach over Zoom, for instance, or I can do my research. But I think that the, for the vast majority of the economy, that's simply not true. If you think about all the industries that are currently on furlough and millions of people uh, losing their uh, livelihoods and their jobs. Um, mm -hmm. I wish we had the uh, the uh, um, you know the institutions to hibernate the economies and then recover from the shocks. I don't think we do, and I don't think we elevate will. It's just too complex. What I would argue for is that. Uh, first of all, we need to massively strengthen the social safety nets, whether that's called a healthcare system, whether that's a called a, a homelessness, whether that's called education. We need to provide all these uh, services, if you like, to the citizenry to make sure that at the very least there is a very uh, solid, robust safety net and that nobody falls through the crack and through mm. the cracks. And that's going to be in, uh, important. I am not one of the people that supports this idea of degrowth or, or moving backwards. I think, and I do believe that uh, and due to human ingenuity and innovation and, and the things that we're discovering every day, that it is possible to bring more people out of poverty. It is more uh, uh, feasible to, to bring more people out of, you know, the, the abysmal conditions that they live on um, because, again, I think the, the degrowth is a luxury that we can argue in the Western world. I think for the billions of people on the planet that don't even know what growth is, uh, it's difficult to talk about degrowth. Happy to talk about more even distribution, more just distribution, certainly a just transition to a more sustainable and inclusive future. I'm personally not... not uh, 
uh, rethinking what is growth, rethinking the system towards human well-being, um, mm. but uh, growth in non-economic terms, even if you like, I think that's a that's that's a good objective to have, given how many people are not even experiencing growth and 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 live in abysmal conditions around the planet. Um, as for academic research. Um, it's it's a hypothetical, right? I don't think we have ever seen a degrowth, and therefore, uh, yes, there are ideas on the table. But correct me if I'm wrong. Probably you know these books and ideas better than I do. I think when they talk about degrowth, at the heart of what they're discussing is basically a different model of growth uh, that accounts for these more complex social issues and well-being and so on. Um, it's not about going backwards in the very the growth as in hibernate the whole economy thing. And I really hope and pray that we are going to find better ways of reducing our emissions and our negative impacts and so on, that we are going to be investing more and expect pandemics and minimize or eliminate their tragic loss of life and so on without necessarily in general slowing down uh, because we have a lot to do and many people to, uh, many people to bring along with us. If I can uh, add something, although uh, I'm from communication and you're from London, business economics. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, degrowth, what I understood also is the fact that sometimes when we say that, um, I heard a professor here in, in Quebec saying that it's, we, the, 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 the society is actually still growing, but the fact is it's decreasing the speed. Isn't it like this is also a fact that we are still growing, but we are reducing the speed of the actual uh, speed that we have right now. Am I am I right saying that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the growth is one of these terms that prob like sustainability probably means different things for different yeah. people and has a hundred definitions based on who That's is using right. it. I mean, as I said, Karin, I think I do think it's the it's not again, it's not the matter of speed for me, at least, because if we get the content of growth right as, for instance, well-being, yes. uh, I want maximum growth uh, so it can uh, cover the world's billions that do not enjoy the things that we are privileged to enjoy as long as we mm -hmm. can do this without you know, killing the future of the planet. Why not? Right. I think is the content of growth and the and the, the way we measure growth and we me the way that we institute growth, if you like, uh, that that needs to change. There's no, it's, it's it's all the problems of the system that you mentioned in, in your uh, wonderful opening. That that yeah. that does um, uh, it is objective, right? That's right. And thank you for your answer. Thank you for your question also, Mark. And I, if I can summarize, it's more, it's also a crisis, a human crisis. We always say it's a climate change. It's the, it's a, the urgency, the climate urgency. But, you know, in communication, I think to be efficient, we can say it's a human crisis. And that's my friend Shalom, actually, from uh, Israel that, you know, spoke to me about that. We had that discussion and I thought it was such a good resume, a good summary. It's also a human crisis. So let's think about that this way also. We have another question. Do we have time for another question, Dr. Yanu? Would it be- Yeah, let's take, uh, let's take one more. Okay, let's take and one then more. We'll, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll finish with this last question. So it's Yan, I believe. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Professor, for these great insights and for your time. Uh, my question is in regards to real ESG positive impact. Um, it was mentioned that uh, at the board of directors level, the people are gonna actually have to care if they're gonna instill change, but I find that difficult because we as people are creatures driven by incentives and same as businesses. So their incentives are to, to grow returns and, and profitability, but they might care if, if ESG can uh, drive this profitability because consumers care and they're demanding for this. So that might drive them to, to change positively in ESG. And my question is, what do you think is going to be a bigger force of change um, at the customer demands level or at the government regulations or maybe a wider mm. uh, global institutions that are enacting these standards? Mm -hmm. Uh, Etienne, great question. Uh, uh, and uh, Karine Etienne is one of our executive MBA students from our Dubai cohort and currently one of my students. So great to see you uh, joining oh. us, uh, Etienne. And I see a couple of others on the call Wonderful. as well. So uh, Antonia, Kwanza and a couple of others. Thank you guys for joining. Oh. He's got his um, hands up, I'm telling you. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> so this is a great question. I think that uh, Etienne and, and, and everyone, I think that there is a whole host of, of pressures uh, on acting on companies. I, I don't know 
which one is the strongest, but all of them are becoming stronger. And let me uh, try to summarize them, at least from the, the way I see them. So first of all, this is a generational shift. Uh, it's a generational shift from the baby boomers to the Gen Zs and to millennials and Gen Zs. What does that mean? It means that, first of all, um, consumer demands are changing, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, we know that millennials are demanding more ethical and more socially responsible standards. So that's one big force. Second of all, we know that millennials and Gen Z that jointly are going to be about 50% of the labor force, right? They are demanding alignment from within, in other words, as employees and uh, in terms of what their companies are doing. And third of all, we uh, we actually are in the process of seeing what we call this intergenerational transfer of wealth, where we, according to some estimates, there's going to be about $10 trillion that go from the baby boomers to, to the millennials. In other words, the, the investment side is coming at this very strong, um, especially when you talk about you know uh, high net worth individuals, especially we talk about pension funds, uh, um, you know employees that entered the labor force now and they have another 30 years in front of them, they ask and they demand to know uh, how their money, their pensions, and their savings are being used because they're not interested in investing in companies or sectors that are going to make the world a much worse place to live in when they retire. Um, so the generational shift also, we slowly but steadily start seeing it in the boardroom as well. I think we're going, and that's as part of the demands for more diversity and more uh, uh, gender equality in the boardroom. Because let's be honest, for many years, and especially if you think about UK pension funds, these boards have been dominated by old white British male. And I have had this discussion before. And sometimes it becomes an appalling discussion because uh, I we start talking about the problems of the world. And some of these people very explicitly were telling me, I don't care about making the world a better place uh, or who am I to, 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 to um, uh, you know, uh, agree of what the world a better place is. So I, I was thinking that, you know, at the very basic level of human decency, we can agree that eliminating, you know, going through the sixth biggest extinction on this planet uh, and, and, and stopping that extinction, we can all agree that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would agree. I would think that we can agree on that basic level. So we have the generational issue. We have the investment issue. Inevitably, whether you think about environmental issues or you think about social issues, these are risks. These are worsening risks. And many times, um, think about how we've been traditionally educating either MBAs or MBAs or finance students, right? Mm -hmm. This these issues simply did not neatly fill into the Excel uh, into the uh, into the Excel sheets that gave us company valuations, then yet they are massive risks. That's mm -hmm. why you see insurance companies, what do they hire these days? They hire climate scientists because if they are offering flooding insurance, well they better know how much they will be paying and what is the actual risk that they're facing when they sell that that kind of insurance, right? So the language of risk and, and the, the, the real threat and the real risk that these issues pose are generating huge demands on the investment side. And the one thing I will finish up is that uh, the, the, the idea of the civil society, I think that's very important. And we've seen civil society coming together and demanding accountability on so many issues. For instance, in the UK, Share Action is an NGO that actually holds the entire asset management industry accountable because it tells them, look, BlackRock, you said you're a climate uh, uh, leader, but you only voted 10% of the cases for climate resolution. So what's going on, right? So that sort of transparency, you have more radical transparency in terms of what Extinction Rebellion is doing that says, you know, if you think it's an inconvenience that I shut down the street this morning, wait until temperatures go up above two degrees compared to pre-industrial times. Yeah. You have the activism a la Greta Thunberg, which is also very effective and touches personally the people in terms of, uh, you know, almost bringing them face to face with their accountability towards future generations. And that can also be very powerful at an emotional and personal level. So there are so many different uh, uh, pressures from within as well as outside companies. And I do think to your last point about <clears throat> government regulation, 
that's also coming from society. That comes from what we, where we vote. That comes from companies, uh, sorry, from countries realizing how these risks are even national security risks, right? Even the Pentagon came out and said that climate change is the bigger risk, biggest risk to the American military. Uh, if we talk about uh, national security, even uh, when, when we start talking about, you know, if, we, if you think we have seen a wave of, my, of migration currently, wait, wait until we see climate refugees starting to move out of, uh, you know, sub-Saharan countries due to the uh, 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 desertification of, yeah. of, of vast amounts of uh, uh, of land and, and start thinking about water conflicts because there is no no more water for people to survive on, let alone uh, build industry. So all of those reasons, that's why, um, Etienne, and I'll finish on that, I always say that uh, this is the mother of all disruptions. This mm -hmm. is this is the, the tsunami of pressures that's already here and is growing. And I'm always kind of shocked and uh, surprised when companies ignore this. And, and but on the other hand, you know, you know, if you're an investor, that precisely should tell you where you should not be investing right now. Um, you know, go short on them, go long on civilization. And I think uh, it's the best uh, advice one could give. Um, I hope that answers it. By the way, this is coming up in our <laughs> in our strategic management course as well in a couple of lectures when I see you guys back in March. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. I feel like doing another course into this, this field that seems to be quite interesting. Thank you for your question, Etienne. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Ianis, for answering so well this uh, complex uh, question. And uh, see if some people do have any question because you're not necessarily part of a sustainability uh, sector, uh, please do so. Like, you know, if BlackRock doesn't read anything, uh, ring anything to you, please just write on onto our uh, platform, the uh, Conscious Strategist Hub, and we will answer. We're there for, for you. We're there to uh, speak with you and answer any acronym or any question that you guys have. Some, sometimes the um, the lingo of a field is it can be confusing, but it has to be clear so everybody uh, bring on the message. So thank you so much, everyone, for staying that long. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iwanu. It was a wonderful uh, experience to be with you. Uh, we feel that we are really in the same room with you. So it is an honor and a privilege to have that conversation with you. And you brought us a lot of insight, a lot of action that we can take to be impactful as professionals in every sectors and to be impactful in the long term. So to have a better and brighter future. So please, uh, I want to say thank you uh, on behalf of Conscious Strategies Group uh, that organized this event. And everybody, please use our platform, the Conscious hub on LinkedIn. We are only on LinkedIn right now. It's under construction. Everything is getting structured and we are there to speak with you, answer questions and provide information to be a catalyzer to help uh, the, the future that is coming to us. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ioannou. And thank you, uh, Karine, and thank you for everyone for joining your great questions and your engagement. Uh, I have joined the hub as well and I certainly look forward to continue this conversation and uh, and this uh, hopefully broader collaboration as i said every single one of us have a role to play and collectively we can do so much more so i really look forward to being part of your community as well and thank you for your warm welcome into the, your community today thank you so much thank you everyone and you thank can you. follow dr you and you he's got so many platform like he's really like a strategist into social media if you need a hand like he's really really good i'm telling you and he's doing that uh, all by himself is uh, pretty active and dynamic and we need leader like that and it's all inside of you everyone's got a voice just use it and we need it to have a better future Thank you so much, and let's keep the conversation excuse, open. Excuse me, Corinne. Good morning. Sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you. Who you guys give me a, a look, good-looking face, good-looking smile, so we can take a photo. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, it's my friend Sandy. And, and the rest of the group, if they don't mind, can they put their cameras on? Yes. Oh, yeah. Do, let's do that. My friend Sandy is from the our Conscious Strategies group. He's Fix from Puerto, Puerto Rico. <laughs> Puerto Rico. Thank you, Sandy. He's always so good. He's always good with social media and he's everywhere. So thank you. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Task force. Okay. Oh, 
Yay! Thank you, Sandy, for thinking about that. Count of five. One, two, <laughs> three, four, five. Here we go. All right, all right, all right. Thank right. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you, everybody. It. All right, See thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Let's keep the discussion open. Ciao.